All right, everyone, let's get started. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Mohsen Lesani. He's an associate professor from UC Riverside. Uh, he did his postdoc at MIT, PhD from UCLA. And he, his research is on reliability and security of software systems, especially concurrent and distributed systems. He's received some prestigious awards, like uh, NSF Career Award and DARPA Young Faculty Award. And today he's here to tell us about his work on synthesis and verification of distributed systems. Uh, without further ado, thank you. Thanks so much, Alan. Thanks so much, Alan, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. I'm glad to be here. You have a very nice conference room. So I try to give a good talk. Uh, my name is Mohsen uh, Lesani, and I'm going to talk about synthesis and verification of distributed systems. You might know Alan Kay. He is the Turing Award winner. He uh, basically invented object-oriented programming. I was lucky to sit in his class. And one day he said, most software today is very much like an Egyptian pyramid with millions of bricks piled on top of each other with no structural integrity, but just done by brute force. And if you connect some of these shaky pyramids together, you get a distributed system that's even more shaky. And they are everywhere. They are in the data centers. They are in network and IoT devices. The uh, distributed systems are in replicated control controllers in medical devices and aircrafts, sometimes in life-critical and vision-critical domains. And our systems have grown widely in all these areas without formal guarantees of correctness. And this is a reality that if you don't counter, that's going to show itself up in catastrophes. A blackout happened in uh, North America that had a cost of $10 uh, million. The cause was a race uh, concurrency bar uh, in an energy man management software in Ohio. In another incident, uh, in the same day, New York Stock Exchange halted trading, and United Airlines had to uh, ground all flights. At first, they thought that the country is being attacked, so the president was briefed about it. But then later, they realized these are independent problems in distributed systems and data centers. And in retrospect, this is not so surprising if you look back at what Lampert wrote in one of his seminal papers. He said, informal reasoning about distributed computing is more likely to lead to errors than any other area in computer science and mathematics. Distributed systems are complicated because they have to deal with concurrency, uh, multiple nodes run at the same time, and that causes state space explosion problems. So it's really hard to check all the states. It's impossible to check all the states. And they also have to deal with crashes of nodes, of course. And some of these nodes may be malicious, they may be compromised, and they have to deal with that as well. This complication is not only for system designers. Of course, system designers have to design these middleware, which is very complicated. But at the same time, this complication is sometimes exposed to programmers. Here in Stack Overflow, a developer is saying that does strong consistency mean 100% consistency? You might know the spectrum of consistency conditions from weak to strong. And modern data stores expose these weaker notions to the user. And it's very confusing for them to understand what is this data store really providing? What sort of guarantees are we getting from this data store? Another developer says, I'm a little bit afraid of the word eventual. Right? They provide eventual consistency. It's really hard to understand what that means, what sort of consistency I'm getting for my data. So developers are confused, and this confusion can lead to further bugs. The mission of my research is to address the reliability and security of uh, distributed systems access the stack, both for the middleware and the applications. The two sides of stacks are complementary, but they have different nature and they require a different treatment. Uh, so on the middleware side, uh, we have these layered uh, implementation of fundamental protocols like consensus and broadcast. Uh, they are usually subtle protocols that are devised over the years, improved over the years. <coughs> And the correctness of the whole application stack is dependent <coughs> on these protocols. We uh, capture these protocols as uh, functional programs in the Cartor Improver. And we capture the guarantees of these protocols 
as deep specifications in expressive logics. We design compositional program logics to verify the layers in a modular way. We could mechanically verify layers of this, uh, this stack. We also could mechanically verify <coughs> key value source and transactional objects. You know, programming anything is very hard in, uh, in functional languages, in Turing and Kruger's, especially if you want a functional system. It's really complicated. It's really hard. It's very time consuming. It requires a lot of effort. But once you do that, you get re these reusable components of uh, distributed systems that can be used by a wide range of developers. <coughs> and the good thing about this is that it comes with the guarantees, right? So you get the code and you get the proof of correctness. So this was on for the middle side, middleware side. On the application side, the developers are still exposed to these low-level abstractions. These low-level abstractions uh, uh, are really subtle and error-prone to program with. And they are very brittle and uh, uh, repetitive because the high level requirements can change. Then you have to go through all the code and see what these low level primitives that you used were, are they still correct or not? You know, looking at this, this reminds me of the go to unstructured programming feature that was in the mainstream programming languages, but later was considered harmful and removed from programming languages. I believe that we can uh, specify the specifications that uh, we want at a very high level. The user should be able to say what it wants from a distributed protocol at a very high level, what the requirements are. And then I believe that the synthesizer have to take up this task of automatically figuring out what the components are, what the right consistency conditions are, and basically give us either the distributed application or the complicated modules. And at this level, middleware is really the instruction set. You know, so. The protocols that we talked about at the middleware layer, they're complicated enough themselves, and you, knew, you need verification methodologies to verify them. But at this level, when we look at applications, they are really only the instruction set. If we can implement this approach, uh, it will bring programmer productivity, it will bring system efficiency, reliability, and security. Automated distributed programming may seem far-fetched, but with the advances in automated reasoning tools, it's more possible than ever before, more feasible than ever before. And in fact, our group has uh, had some success in this direction, some definite su success in this direction. We could develop uh, principles and tools uh, that synthesize distributed systems with security, consistency, and convergence properties. These are the three favorable properties in distributed computing. Uh, I want to show that program synthesis is very versatile. It's applicable to all these areas. I'm going to show you an overview of three projects before talking about one of them in more detail. In fact, I believe that this is the area that program synthesis can shine. This is a subtle area that program synthesis can be more uh, helpful than simple uh, uh, functional program, functional language, functional, fun functional uh, snippets of code that usually we synthesize. I think if we apply synthesis at this level, to help system, system design, application design, it's going to be more, more helpful. OK, so let's look at the first project, uh, synthesis of secure and resilient distributed system, systems. Um, so consider a healthcare system. We, uh, we have a system with multiple use cases. This system might be implemented uh, using the features provided by multiple clouds. And the reason for that is that they provide different features, or we want more availability and reliability. But there are also regulations that the healthcare system has to uh, comply with. Some data should be kept on the premise cloud. <clears throat> so some data is, uh, is at the hospitals, some is on the cloud. When you develop a system like that, your system is scattered in multiple organizations. And the nodes in different organizations might crash. And some of them may be controlled by an adversary, may be malicious, and they may actively try to break your system. What we want is that the user specifies at a high level what confidentiality, integrity, and availability policies it wants to hold for this whole system. And then we want to automatically decide how the system should be uh, deployed, how much replication we need to achieve these policies. So we basically want to automate the process of developing these distributed systems. <coughs> 
The only thing that we require from the user is to write the service. Here we have a healthcare service. Uh, it's a class. We uh, can declare the fields that we want uh, in this service and also the methods for the actual services. For example, here you can see that the medical images are confidential only for the hospital. There's a an type annotation that specifies that. And you can also see type annotations for integrity and availability policies that we want for the service uh, aggregate diagrams. You explicitly say how much uh, integrity or availability you expect from this service. And then the system has to figure out how to replicate this. So the user specifies the class and trustworthiness policies. In the first step, we partition the program, the method that you saw. We, uh, in the first step, we partition that into, uh, into simpler uh, methods. Then we apply an information flow type inference system to automatically figure out where the fields and methods of the class have to be placed and how much we have to replicate them. Once we have this information, we can compose Byzantine fault tolerant protocols uh, and uh, synthesize resilient distributed systems. As you see again, these complicated Byzantine fault tolerant protocols are just the instruction set for this synthesis process. I'm going to get back to this project and we're going to see examples of, examples of that. But as another example where synthesis can be very helpful, I'm going to, I want to talk about distributed consistency. There are many notions of consistency that modern data stores expose to the programmers. And there are uh, theoretical results that uh, state that there is a trade-off between consistency on one hand and responsiveness and availability on the other hand. At the top, we have sequential consistency or generalizability uh, with, uh, with the maximum consistency. On the other end, we have eventual consistency that's more responsive, but you only get uh, consistency in the sense that once all the messages are processed at the very end, the replicas uh, converge to the same state. So you don't get much of a consistency. And in the middle, we have caus causal consistency and a lot more notions. And it's really hard for uh, users to decide which one of these consistency conditions they really need for an operation for the, or for the whole object. It's really a moot question for them. When they're confused. You saw examples of that on Stack Overflow. What the programmers really want is that they declare what the integrity property is. Right. So imagine you have a bank account. All you care is that the balance is never negative, right? You want a non-negative balance, and then you want to do withdrawal and deposit. That's all you care. And it would be great if there is a tool that can automate this process, process that given the integrity properties can decide for you what sort of consistency you need for each one of these methods. And that's exactly what we did. <clears throat> so we let you define a class of objects and declare the integrity properties that you want. And then we have an automatic uh, coordination analysis process that uses automated reasoning tools to figure out the conflict and dependency relations between methods. Once we have these relations, we represent them as graphs, and then we use coordination avoidance to graph minimization problems, the classical graph optimization problems. The result of that is optimized coordination. Once we have that, we can compose these protocols again. Protocols like consensus and causality, you can compose them at the right places. We try to not use consensus when it's not needed. And that's how we optimize these data stores. The result of this protocol composition is both non-blocking and blocking replicated system, systems that keep that integrity that the user wanted all the time, and they converge to the same state at the very end. We actually extended this project further after Pablo 19. We had CAD paper and a PLDR last year. We, uh, we are using RDMA for, uh, for message passing in the data store. And now let me talk about, oh, you have a question. So, I have right, a question. Yes. Maybe sure. Yes. Going back to this integrity specification yes. that you uh, modulate the conflict and then have the record cover and graph problem. Yes. Um, I know you, may, you gave them an example of the bank account, but um, I believe, again, in optimization problem, then um, the way you model your integrity function um, cannot be anything extremely nonlinear. It's, for some functions, you can't really model them as perfect cover problem necessarily, or it's very generic, this model that can cover any type of integrity specification. Do you have, at this point, some limitation? For example, if there's very correlated type of integrity, or, uh, you know, it's, well, it's additive 
function yes. versus how you correlate uh, it. No, I understand. So, so, so the conflict and dependency relations are, are, are binary relations, no matter what the integrity property is, right? Mm -hmm. But you're right that for certain integrity properties or for complicated pieces of code, it's really hard to automate this process. We automate it for, for example, relational queries or relational schemas, which is what people use to describe their data, right? Okay. SQL databases, for example, are based on relational algebra, right? For those, we have methods to automate. So there are theory of relations that are recently supported in C3 and CVC4. Especially CVC4 has a stronger support for it. So some of these, like join, uh, you know, the normal relational operations that we use are supported. So we can answer queries, and then uh, relations can be inferred. Conflict relation, dependency relation can be inferred. There are times when the problem is very complicated, and Z3 comes with unknown, and we conservatively consider that as a conflict. But the thing is, most of it is automatic. For our use cases, it's all automatic. Uh, but the user can also change those tables or relations. You might be able to calculate it yourself, right? Once you give, give that to us, we can continue the, the rest of the process that's also automated. So, so this raises the level of abstraction a lot. If you consider to what Cassandra gives you, for example. Cassandra asks you how many quorum, how many nodes uh, you want to connect to. It asks you the quorum at each operation, which is a really low level. You have no idea how many quorums you have to connect at that point. Right? Uh, so I think uh, what we expose the programmers to at the moment is really low level. It's unusable. Some high level abstraction is needed, and we're trying to do that. Thanks for the question. OK, so another proper distributed system property that we are very much interested to have is termination and convergence. And I talked about that in terms of graph analytics. So graph analytics framework often are based, based on these iterative models, where you have some kernel functions, and these kernel functions are iteratively uh, executed until some sort of convergence is, is, is reached. And to do that, you have to, re to really go ahead and layer the API and uh, write low-level code, or even simple use cases. What we want is this. If you're interested to get the ratio between the diameter and radius of the graph in your social network, this is the equation that you want to have. It's specified as a simple declarative equation on the paths in the graph. We get these declarative specifications in our graphs project, and then we apply fusion transformations inspired by fusion transformations in functional programming languages, and reuse these computations into a canonical sequence of iteration, map, and reduce. And then, once we have this compact uh, representation that tries to optimize and avoid repetitions, then the synthesis process looks for kernel function that does that computation. So we have formal specifications of convergence and termination conditions. And we look for these kernel functions automatically. Once we find the one that satisfies these conditions, we have the kernel function. And from there, it's very easy to compile it to these five high-performance graphs analytics frameworks. They have different API, but we have figured out ways to map our kernel functions to them. And again, here you see that these iterative models are just the instruction set. Each one of these frameworks is pretty complicated, but they are really the instruction set for graph analytics once you have a synthesis process. Okay, so uh, I hope that you see that uh, program synthesis is, is versatile. It's widely applicable to different uh, 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 favorable properties in distributed computing, I want to talk more about uh, resiliency of distributed systems. So I go back to the first project we saw in the overview. Now I'm going to give you an example so that we use it as a running example for the rest of the talk. So this use case is called one-time transfer. It's a very simple use case. Uh, Alice has a value R1, and Bob has a value R2. And the client uh, P0 is interested to read only one of them only once. right? So the system must, must prevent this client from reading both of them or reading more than once. So the client sends its choice, then either we return Alice's value or Bob's value. So that's what we want to do. So how do we do that? Again, we want a central definition, implementation, that doesn't talk about distribution details at all. So this is a normal class. We call it one-time transfer. There we declare the registers R1 and R2 from, for Alice and Bob. And then we also declare another register to record whether the client has already read the value or not. Then, inside, then we de define this transfer method. The transfer method gets the argument x, 
that's a Boolean, uh, uh, true for Alice, bo uh, false for Bob. Then inside, we check if the user has already read the value. If it has read the value, we just return to. If it has not read the value, we record that reading now. And then depending on the parity of x, we return either R1 or R2. OK, so that was a pretty easy uh, implementation. Now we want to specify these trustworthiness policies, like confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And for that, I have to introduce resiliency types. So let's assume that Alice has seven servers and Bob has four servers. Some of them may be malicious, right? We call them Byzantine nodes. Here, Byzantine nodes are A1, A5, A2. So we have an attack scenario, the set of A1, A5, and A2. And here's another attack scenario, A2, A6, and, A and B2. Right? A resiliency type is a set of attack scenarios. So this resiliency type is the set of uh, the two attack scenarios that we just saw. And there are ways that you can capture concisely uh, a lot of these uh, scenarios. Here, for example, we are looking at P2 of A, cross union P1 of B. This is uh, any uh, set of uh, uh, two uh, A's and one B's. So P2 of A is any set of size two, any subset of size two of the set A. So there are concise way of representing resiliency types. OK, so with that, now we can specify what we want for this use case. Here we have the uh, principles that we have available. And then we specify what we want at a very high level. So please note, it's very high level. You're not, you're not specifying how these have to be distributed. You just specify what you want. The security types are triples of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. The first element is confidentiality. For R1, you're saying this is only accessible to A and P0. R2 can be only accessed by B and P0, right? So you're saying the confidentiality requirements. And then the, for the transfer, you define the type. In particular, the return type says that this function must be called only by the client, no one else. And then you explicitly say what sort of integrity and availability you want for this. You say, even if two A, princ A principles or one B principle goes Byzantine, I still want to get the correct value. You know, I still want to know that my the value that this function is returning is the correct value. And I want it to be available even if one uh, server in the A set goes down or gets Byzantine, and one node in the B set goes, gets Byzantine. And it's very easy to trans translate these sets into probabilities, right? Because we know probability of servers going down in a, in a cloud environment. So there is a strong correspondence between probabilities and these sets. But I go with these sets for the rest of the talk because it's more algebraic. So security types, trust, trustworthiness types, are triples of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And mathematically, there are lattices. So for confidentiality, we have sets. Uh, these are the set of, set of principles that are trusted to access data. And supersets can flow to, this, uh, to a subset, of course. If you have, uh, you can trust more nodes, of course, you can flow to something that trusts uh, uh, fewer nodes. Integrity uh, if is, def is defined on uh, resiliency types. So you have a set of attack scenarios. And if you have a large uh, set of attack scenarios with, with large uh, uh, sets, you can flow to smaller set of attack scenarios with smaller sets. Right? So this flow is, is OK. The flow the other, way, the, the other way around is not OK. And availability is also defined as a resiliency type. It's uh, really a set of uh, attack scenarios that we want to be resilient against. OK, so now with this specification, simple specification that we had for this example, let's see how the system has to go about and uh, distribute this for us, uh, implement this for us. So there's a problem here, because R1 can be only uh, put on A uh, or P0, and R2 can be put only on B or P0. And that means that you can only put transfer on P0, but that doesn't give you any sort of replication. You don't get any integrity or availability, right? That's not very helpful. So we need to partition. We want to partition like this, so that R1.read and R2.read, that we call object calls, object method calls, that are shown with green and red here, we want to take them and put them on separate methods. So we want to translate this transfer method into a sequence of continuations. So you see here we have M4, M3, M2, and M1, um, M1, and M2, these are, these are the sequence of method calls 
that are going to be equivalent to the, to, the, to the original method calls, right? But the good thing about it is that we have separate method calls M1 and M2 for these object method calls R1.3 and R2.3, and we can separately place them, right? Uh, so this maximum flexibility uh, that, these, that this property uh, gives us is very important for typing works. We want to have at most one object method call in each one of these partitions. So if you look at M4, there's only one method call uh, inside it. M3 is the same. How do we do that? How do we do this translation? Well, we do that in two steps. The, fir the first step is a factoring transformation. And uh, as you see, it lifts all the object method calls up to the beginning of the branches. So our method on the left is translated on to the expression that you see on the right hand side. How do we do that? We apply a CPS transformation or continuation passing style from function programming. The interesting rule is this that translates the object method calls. So it first evaluates the argument and then translates this object method call to an explicit call expression. After beta reduction, every, every lambda that we create during the uh, CPS transformation is going to go back to normal expressions, but these call expressions are going to stay. They're going to stay at the top. Once we take these at the top, we apply the second transformation, which is, which is a splitting transformation. The goal of this splitting transformation, as I said, is to create uh, method calls, continuations, that have only one object method call inside them. We look at one of these rules, call, and I use uh, this as an example. You see this is an expression. There's an object method call at the top. So how do we handle that? Well, we have an object method call at the beginning, and there's a command after that. We recursively translate the command, and we get a call-free expression. Right? So that command was pretty big, but recursively, what uh, it's going to result in a call-free expression. In this case, in, uh, we, we get this if expression. There's no object method call in it. Once we have that, we define a new method. Uh, here, we call it m3 that has this object method call at the beginning, and then the call-free expression after that. So you see we are generating methods that, has, that have only one object method call at the top. And that's, again, very important for type inference because it lets us uh, uh, have the maximum flexibility for placement. OK, so after this, we get partition methods. Now that we have partition methods, how are going to be, uh, be placed them? Where are they gonna? Where are, where are they gonna be put? And then how much replication do, do we do for them? So here I, uh, for the start, I put m, m of x on the first replica, and then uh, the question is that when is this call uh, call gonna, uh, when, when when should this call be executed? It shouldn't be executed when uh, a request com comes from a Byzantine process, right? So if a Byzantine process calls this uh, method m with a value of b. We cannot trust that argument at all, right? Because it's coming from the Byzantine node. Depending on the integrity of the parameter of this method, uh, we need to receive more requests. So if we want to have integrity for this parameter x against two Byzantine nodes, then we have to read uh, the call from three nodes, uh, from three other nodes, right? So we have to receive three requests so that we can trust it. Because out of three, at least one of them is not Byzantine. And it can be any tree, right? Any uh, set of tree nodes is going to be fine. So we are looking at the quorum system, right? A set of quorums or, or a quorum system, which we call a communication quorum system. So com communication quorum systems are used to read arguments from other nodes. That's the first piece of information that we have to infer for every one of these partitions. The second piece is where we put the method m of x. How many times do we replicate it? Well, if it's replicated only once, so we have one copy, well, that copy can be Byzantine. And then if we have another call after that, <coughs> that call will never happen. You know, So this message that's sending for the next method call in the sequence of continuations doesn't have any integrity. If the parameter of that call wants the integrity against two Byzantine nodes, we have to send this message three times. If that argument wants availability against two, we have to actually send this message replicate this uh, method five times so that at least three of them do send the message so that the argument is available there. Right? So these user uh, policies help us decide how much we have to replicate these methods. Here, that helps us to figure out what the hosts of this method M are. 
how many times should be replicated. So for each partition, we have to infer these pieces of information, the, the set of costs H and the communication quorum uh, system Q. These were for methods. For objects, we have to infer another piece of information, which is the storage quorum system. So if you store your object on three replicas, and two of them are Byzantine, and then you read from another tree, the intersection can be Byzantine, right? And you don't get the latest value. You don't read the correct value. So we have to replicate this object on five nodes so that at least one of them, uh, 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 fall, uh, one correct node falls in the intersection. Intersection has at least one correct node, and you get the latest value. So for objects, we have to infer the set of hosts, the storage quorum system S, and also uh, the communication quorum system. Yes. So in, in these two examples, don't you have to make assumptions about what is the protocol that is followed for writing and reading? Because I would assume as like using different DFT protocols, these quorum sizes would be different. Their communication patterns would be different. But in all of them, there must be a, uh, there, there must be an intersection between quorums, right? So all <laughs> quorum-based systems are based on the fact that any two pair of quorums have a correct intersection. So we're trying to guarantee that. And then you can apply any protocol you want. We, have, we apply DFD smart, as I'm going to talk about in the evaluation. OK, so uh, I'm going to talk about the inference of this placement, which is pretty, pretty complicated later on. But for now, let's assume that we have the placement. So this placement is given. It's automatically inferred. Let's see the flow of execution. Because the execution is now going to be a flow uh, between heterogeneous quorum systems. So here we are looking at, at M3 and M1. They are replicated uh, on B2 uh, to B4 and A, A2 to A5. So we have these nodes, and A5 is Byzantine, B2 is Byzantine. And M3 is calling M1. So the good thing here is that M3 is hosted on two uh, correct nodes, and those two correct nodes that I'm showing by blue, they're going to send messages to uh, the hosts of M1. And the hosts of M1 have, have, have this communication quorum system, P2 of B. They trust the call if it comes from two other processes in the set B. And this is exactly what's happening. The calls are coming from B3 and B4. There are two. So all these processes uh, in M1, all correct processes in M1, the, these three processes, A2, A3, and A4, they're going to receive two requests. They're going to accept it, and they're going to execute M1. M1, in return, will call the res function, which returns the result of the client. It is hosted at the client. It's eventually going to uh, return the result at the client. That method accepts the call only from three A's or two B's. And three A's is exactly what we have here. We have three correct A processes that, they are, that are sending the, the message to res. Res will accept the call and finally return uh, the value here. So you see, we have a flow between these heterogeneous quorum systems which is something that must be synthesized. The writing these by hand is very error prone. So OK, so now I'm going to talk about how we actually find these placements. What the user gave us is, uh, is the trustworthiness types at the high level, and we have the implementation partition. What we want to do is to find the type for each one of the expressions in the partitions. And we also want to find the method uh, and object placement and replications, and actually optimize replication. So we want to minimize replications at the same time. For this, we have a type inference system that enforces the user policies and also enforces constraints on type variables, which are really these placements and replications. So the placement and replications are constraints, uh, have constraints on them. And we later solve those constraints that gives us the, uh, the right replication. I just want to look at part of one of these rules because it's pretty complicated. This is the rule that type checks the uh, method called M of E. So we are on a set of hosts H that are all uh, executing M of E. And we want to type check this call. Is it correct or not? So we first uh, get the type of uh, the method M from the context. Uh, the interesting part is this uh, tau1 here, which is the type of the parameter of this method. So the type of the parameter of this method M is tau1. If you look at, look at that, that's a security type, so it's a triple. The last element is the availability type A1. And this method M is uh, placed on the quorum system, uh, is accepting uh, calls from the quorum system Q. Now we want to make sure that this quorum system Q is strong enough to provide this availability that is required by the parameter. 
And that's where this constraint comes from. So this constraint is saying if we are accepting calls from this quorum system Q, the set of costs H is large enough to provide the availability that we want. So you see these user-specified policies are translated to these constraints that determine how, how much and where we have to replicate things. We proved interesting formal properties for this type system. We proved non-interference, which means that if you have a well-typed method, so if you use our type system and you have a, a method that is well-typed, so the type checker says yes, then the return value of that method is never affected by changing the, uh, the values of the objects of supertypes. So if you have an object that is of higher confidentiality, lower integrity, or lower availability, that can never affect your function, the return value of your function. The second interesting property is resilience. Resilience to supertypes. So if you have a method that in, and, and it's well typed, the type checker says yes, and you have integrity type I for that, then any attack that is a subtype of this uh, resiliency type A uh, will not affect the correctness of the return value. So any attack that is weaker than the specification that you gave cannot take the system down. And the same holds for availability. So if, you try, uh, if, if, if your method is type checked and is well typed, then any attack that is a subtype of your integrity and availability type cannot affect the availability of, availability of your method. So your method is going to continue to be available in the face of those attacks. OK, so now once we have these constraints out of the type system, we have to solve them. And the space is pretty large. So to handle this space, uh, we have a pretty interesting representation that helps, helps us move forward. So we have three sets of principal classes here, right? So we have A, B, and P0, so three classes. So we want to represent everything as triples. For sure, we can do that for confidentiality. So if we have confidentiality A union P0, that can be simply represented as 1 for A, 0 for B, and 1 for P0. 1 for trusted, 0 for not trusted. The set of hosts can also be represented as triple. So if you have a 2 A, A process and 1 B process, then that, that can be represented as 2, 1, and 0. The interesting part is the quorum systems. How do we represent quorum systems? So, so you saw P2 of A uh, cross union P1 of B. That can that be represented as 2, 1, 0. And to support a larger space, we, uh, we support N such sets. So if you have, in our use case, uh, three sets, the union of three, uh, three sets, you can represent that as three uh, tuples. So we have N tuples of size N to represent quorum systems. And resiliency types were also the same. There were sets of sets. So they are also represented <coughs> as these n triples of size n. With that representation, all these constraints that are generated by the type system on the left-hand side can be translated to uh, theory of linear arithmetic, which is related to what you said. So linear arithmetic uh, is a theory that is supported by all these Turing provers, uh, by Z3 and uh, CDC4. Um, and you know, the solvers for this theory has become more and more efficient over the years. In fact, we get really quick answers from, for, 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 these, for these constraints. I'm going to show you the timing in a second. But let's look at one of these. Yes? Have you encountered any nonlinear functionalities that sort of have been approximated as linear? Or? We are approximating as linear. So if we wanted to support all, so, if we, if, so this, this is super expensive, right? So. If you have sets of sets, sets, sets of sets is like exponential. It's going to explode really quickly. What we do is that we, we support a large enough space that's manageable. So here, for example, you can have, uh, uh, you can choose the elements only from A, elements only for B, elements only from, from the last set. You can also mix them. So it's a large enough space that gives us uh, what we want. And if you look at the use cases, it's really what we do. It, you can come up with pretty complicated examples, but it doesn't quite fit here. But those are really contrived examples. Those don't, don't, don't happen in, in practice. So, so we, we convert everything to the theory of linear arithmetic, which is quite fast, very fast. You will be surprised how many constraints these modern SMP solvers can solve in a fraction of a second. I want to just talk about one of these constraints because we don't have a whole lot of time. So here we are saying that the 
uh, integrity of this quorum system Q is more than uh, this resiliency type P, which means that if you look at any one of the quorums inside this quorum system Q, that quorum, that set, doesn't fall inside any one of the attack scenarios in P, right? So any set I, 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 I get from the Q doesn't fall in any one of the sets inside P. And the way we represent this is that we say, okay, if I look at any tuples in Q, any tuple I in Q, and if I look at any tuple I prime in B, then for at least one of the elements of those two tuples, element J, the first must be greater than the second. Right? So we should have <coughs> more principles in at least one of the principal classes uh, so that we don't completely fall in the attack scenario. Right? We have at least one well-behaved outside the attack scenario. So you see this is just an inequality and then logical connectors between them. We applied this technique, we, we built a tool, we applied the technique to uh, use cases from the literature, and as you see, the is pretty fast. In less than, let's say, five minutes, we can infer all the types, all the placements automatically. Then we started injecting faults into the generated systems. So here we are increasing the injected faults up to the specification. So if the specification says we are resilient to six nodes, six failures, we fail six. And as you see, the system is responsive, it continues to to process the requests. The other thing that this uh, uh, experiment shows is that uh, the response time is affected uh, more when you fail a leader compared to when you fail a follower. Of course, because the leader has to do configuration and a new leader has been selected. So when you fail leaders, it affects the responsiveness, the response time more. In the second experiment, we try to increase the resiliency of the system and see how, how it scales. Our tool can adjust the replication properly so that the response time increases only proportionally to the resiliency that it provides. So it really replicates when needed. It doesn't replicate when we don't need the replication. That's again because we do minimization too. Modern SMP solvers not only find a solution that satisfies all the constraints, but you can also provide an objective function that try to, they try to minimize. And we try to minimize the replication so that we don't replicate more than enough. Okay, so we got, let me quickly tell you what uh, we can go from here. So the first thing is that we really want to um, uh, rep automatically replicate cloud services. Uh, we want to automate the security decisions. And we have already started uh, automatically generating Kubernetes uh, uh, configuration files. To make this more practical, there are a few challenges that we have to solve. First, we have to uh, write or infer a cost model because uh, People uh, are interested to uh, minimize the cost in terms of uh, dollar amount that they pay for their system. If it's cheaper to go on Google, they want to go there. If it's cheaper on, on Amazon, they want to go there if it provides the same level of security, integrity, and availability. The other thing that we are trying to incorporate is that up to now, we were statically deciding everything. Right? All that, that, I, that I presented was static. But we have to have this dynamic side of things too because you might statically design the plan but you go ahead and run it and because the cloud doesn't have enough capacity or there is an interoperability problem, your plan doesn't quite work, right? So you have a physical plan but that, that doesn't work. So what do we do then? What we want to do is that we want to learn from the failure of that plan. We want to represent it as a constraint and loop it back to the synthesis process so that the synthesis process learns that that doesn't work so that it comes up with another plan that satisfies all the previous constraints and doesn't fall into this uh, previous plan that didn't work. There is also a lot of uh, possibilities to extend the theory for this work. There are things that we cannot support at the moment with the current type system. For example, if you want uh, more uh, integrity, the current type system says that you have to replicate more, right? So you replicate more, you get more, more, more integrity. But the problem is that when you replicate more, then you are actually decreasing confidentiality because you're trusting more nodes. Uh, that's not, uh, that's not uh, quite what we want. There seems to be a trade-off here. But if we use crypto primitives like commitments, if we store only the hash of the secrets on these replicas, then we are not really trusting them. We can read the hash of the values and that can help us to validate the integrity, but uh, we are not revealing the secrets to the, to the, to the replicas. 
the same trade-off uh, holds between availability and confidentiality. If you want to have um, uh, more availability, you replicate more, and then you're trusting all of them. But you don't need to do that. The current type system rejects it. That's the only way it knows. Uh, but um, if you use threshold schemes, then then the whole quorum has, has to come together to rec reconstruct the value, right? So we're not storing the secret in each one of the replicas, but we are, let's say, storing the part, and all of them have to come together. So we are not trusting each one of them anymore. Uh, we are trusting all of them together. So threshold schemes can be used here. There are also cases where no single node is confidential enough to execute the, uh, the method. There might be partitions where, they, where you cannot find a single node that can host that computation. So for that, you can use multi-party computation. These are crypto pro protocols that let you do the computation. Multiple parties do a computation without revealing the secret. And finally, there are cases where the node has enough integrity but not confidentiality. We reject those cases. A cloud server can be uh, an example that has integrity. We know that it does the computation correctly, but it's not confidential. We don't want to reveal the secret to that node. So we can use hardware enclaves for that. There's no support in the type system at the moment for this. And then finally, there are cases where there is confidentiality but not integrity. The, the server has the secret, but we are not sure that it will do the uh, correct processing. Right? In that case, we can use zero-knowledge proof. Proofs it can provide an attestation that it has done the computation properly, and that would be enough for us to move forward. So all of these can be supported with the same methodology that I uh, presented. More expressive, better type systems can be designed to achieve all of these together. And in this case, again, back to the methodology that I was advocating for, crypto and enclaves are really just the instruction set. Once you have a, a synthesis process, you can use this to build a larger system and at the same time more reliable system. Thanks so much for listening. Uh, if you have questions, I will be glad to answer.